Good morning, Sonoma Valley friends and family. We're so glad to see you again on this last Sunday in April 2020. If you've just connected with us on Facebook, we're so happy you've joined us. I want to invite you to share your awareness of Sonoma Valley Community Church with more people so we can have as many people as possible joining with us to celebrate our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name's Henrik Mann, this is my wife Charlotte, and we're so glad to welcome you this morning to the house of the Lord here in Sonoma. I'd like to invite you to join me in an opening prayer just to ask God to join with us and to speak his love into our hearts. Lord God, we come to you this morning asking for your grace, your kindness, your love to fill our hearts. Lord God, we want to invite you to help us get our eyes off of ourselves, get our eyes off of others, and get our eyes off of the circumstances of the world just for a moment to look on your face and to know that you're looking at our face. Lord, we pray that as you work in our hearts and lives through this service, Lord God, that we will be changed we will be reminded that our living God is walking with us. Lord, we pray for your favor and your blessing on all the friends and family of Sonoma Valley Community Church, and we pray that you bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we'd like to welcome you also and welcome the Lord by singing some songs. My wife, has been helping pick some songs here this morning. We want to invite you, if you know the song, to join us. If not, hum along. Nobody's going to care how you sing, but God's watching, so let's <laughs> sing together. I have a maker. He formed my heart. He sing a song that we hum along with each other in the car and at other times. Lord, you are. Lord, you are. You want to start off? And we're going to sing that, Lord, you are more precious than silver. You are more costly than gold. And you are more beautiful than diamonds. Let's sing along. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. Now we want to have you sing along with us. Let's do this a second time now that you know the words. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with Amen. 
want to invite the Lord to speak to our hearts. And there's a devotion that I'd like to just share with you from Sarah Young. She writes for April 28th, which is coming up. Trust in me at all times. Pour out your heart to me, for I am your refuge. The more you rely on me, the more effectively I can help you. Trusting me is appropriate for all circumstances. Joyful and sorrowful, peaceful and stressful. In fact, things that cause you stress can serve as reminders to seek my face. I want you to remember that I am with you, taking care of you, even when life hurts. Talk with me about your troubles and leave them with me. Then rest in my presence while I go to work on your behalf. Tell yourself the truth about me. Use words of scripture to describe me. You are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I am indeed a refuge, a safe place to find shelter in the storms of life. Speaking or singing such truths is an effective way to draw near me. Your mind usually has several thoughts or thought fragments passing through it at once. Instead of just thinking about me, speak out loud. That gives focus to your thoughts and to your trust in me. Mm -hmm. Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. And 1 Chronicles 16, 11, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. And 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And finally, Psalm 91, 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to learn how to trust in you in all times. There are people hurting who might see this video, might see this service, and they need some comforting words, some words of wisdom from the living God. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak your wisdom into all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to share some announcements with you. Uh, Charlotte was reminding me that Ann McIntyre has a happy birthday today. Mm -hmm. And so did you want to sing that? We missed some other birthdays since That's we're true. trying but to come we, up to speed. Well, we can't this. sing for everybody, but right. maybe we can do our little bit for Ann this morning. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anne. And Peggy was last week, and uh, I think amen. we had a few others. <laughs> amen. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're trying to get more into the party and fellowship spirit. And, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is a party. That's what we talked about last week. So uh, this week, we want to put that into practice a little bit by having a Zoom Fellowship Sunday uh, hour. So we all enjoy fellowship in the back of the sanctuary, in our fellowship hall, and the nice goodies that everybody gets to share, and the, the hugging and the talking and all of that. Well, today we're gonna do a virtual fellowship event. Uh, for the first time in the history of this church, we're going to do a Zoom meeting at noon today. So that's just like an hour and 20 minutes away. And we're going to ask that every one of you who's watching and all those that we sent a letter to, mm -hmm. that you join us for that Zoom meeting. Get and, your uh, angel eggs, get amen. your goodies. We're going to be ready for you. So um, anyways, we, we've sent a letter to everybody who is uh, part of our church family and friends. And if you, if you need that Zoom link, uh, we'll try to get it to you. Also want to let you know that um, uh, you can contact our church about anything that's on your heart or mind or ask for prayer 
through our email, info at welovesonoma.com. That's info at welovesonoma.com. I <coughs> also want to let you know that um, we are still receiving tithes and gifts and offerings and, and financial donations, and we're doing that both by receiving checks in the mail and checks that come by envelope that are dropped through our mail slot, but we're also having now donation giving through the internet, through our website. And you can find that giving page at uh, www.welovesonoma.com. And I just want to say a word about why we give. We don't just give to keep the lights on. We don't just give because we want to see the uh, ministries of the church continue. But we, we give because it's a transaction between us and the living God where we just go for it and, and let God do his special work in our lives. So I want to invite you to join with me in giving this week through the internet website. And then finally, I wanna to, want to highlight a couple of pastoral care notes. Uh, we're praying for Arlene and Blake and Christine and the Duffy sisters and Margaret Leinster and others uh, for their health needs. And uh, we wanna invite you to join with us as we pray for our friends, our dear fellowship, family, that's Sonoma Valley Community Church friends. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would do a healing work in the lives of our dear family and friends who are needing a special healing touch from you. I pray, Lord God, that you would work especially in the lives of those I've just mentioned. I ask, Lord God, that you would remove pain. I pray that you would rehabilitate their bodies, that you would give them new strength, new hope, new vision, new direction. And Lord God, I just want to thank you for the dear lady, my cola, who I met today while I was exercising this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, mm -hmm. it was a privilege to pray for her um, as she is dealing with a, a husband who's in hospice. Mm -hmm. And I just thank you, Lord, that we can reach out mm -hmm. and pray with anybody who just says, yes, I'd love it if you would pray for me. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we pray that you would do a special work in all the hearts of the people of Sonoma Valley Community Church to be looking for opportunities to pray for pray with and for people. Mm -hmm. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now Charlotte and I want to sing an old standby, a precious song that we've sung many times here at the church. And it has to do with our relationship with God, that he be our vision. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, and ask for the Holy Spirit to minister to you as you hear it. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day. Still be my vision, O 
invite you to come and join with me as we snack together on the Word of God. We're going to come and sit down here at the little table. And I just want to also make mention that we have a whole world, a whole world map here because God loves the whole world. And I just want to let you know that Charlotte and I are praying for America. We're praying for South America. We're praying for for Europe, where our son lives. We're praying for Africa, where I have friends and have gone to many countries there. We're praying for the Middle East, especially Dubai, where I have been many times. We're praying for India and China and for Australia and New Zealand and for Russia. And it's not just, um, you know, a, a map. This, these are people's lives around the world and they all matter to God. And uh, it's so good to be a part of the global family of God. Well, as we come to the Word of God this morning, I'm realizing that I left my Bible over there in the, in the backpack. So my wife's going to grab that real quick. It's in the front packet, pocket. Um, and then as soon as I have that Word, then I can read it to you. You know, when most of us think about the quality of Christians whom we know, um, and who we know face to face in our circles of friendship and influence, many adjectives come to mind. And hopefully most of them are positive, of course. We all want to be held in good regard. When we think about the personality traits or the values of those who make up this community for the world at Sonoma Valley Community Church, I think it would be fair to say that we've earned and are branded with the words loving, faithful, and seasoned church. We've been around for 75 years, and the folks here have got a great heart for each other and for God. Now, actually, we've also been working to change our reality some and our image some, and, and we've got a new sign out front and part of our advertising that we value beauty goodness, wisdom, and fruitfulness. Those values on our sign and in our newspaper advertisement and on our website and other places, they reflect our sense of the kinds of lives that we're trying to lead and of the values that are part of the Sonoma Valley community. Each of those values reflect part of God's nature found in the Bible and also reflect Values that characterize this city, like beauty. This is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And we also want to behold the beauty of the Lord. Um, fruitfulness. Billions of dollars of wine are shared with the world that come from Sonoma. And there's the Sonoma, William Sonoma label, and there's other kinds of great things that have come out of Sonoma. There's a lot of fruitfulness and there's a lot of wisdom here in Sonoma. You know, there are many qualities, many qualities and traits that could be applied to being a Christian today. But I want to introduce you this morning to a particular and slightly peculiar quality of the Christian life. And that's the one that Jesus shares with us in a parable found in Luke 16, 1 to 13. Luke 16, 1 to 13. So if you have your Bibles, which I now do have this one, uh, Luke chapter 16. Here we go. Please join with me. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. 
So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with a little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have been not trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for your wisdom. Lord, help us open up. Help us sit with the lessons that you have to teach us from this parable of the shrewd manager. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we were talking just before I read that scripture about the kinds of words that get attached to Christians these days. And uh, many of us realize that the word shrewd is kind of an uncomfortable one to put with the name of Christian. It's kind of an oxymoron. Two terms that don't fit together may actually feel like opposites in our mind, like seriously funny or awfully pretty or jumbo shrimp or paid volunteers. And here's a favorite of mine, military intelligence. You get the idea. So as we look at this parable of our lives about the shrewd manager, the big idea seems to be that Jesus calls on his followers to become as shrewd in doing good as others are doing in what helps only themselves or doing evil. Let me repeat that. Jesus is calling on his followers to become as shrewd in doing good as others are in doing what helps only themselves or doing evil. The reason is that he wants us to cheat death and not get caught up in spiritually unproductive activities that lead to what might be called a lost life. According to one dictionary, shrewd means keen-witted, clever, or sharp in practical matters. And the secondary definition is cunning, and that is the definition most of us think of, someone who uses their intellect or ability to take advantage of a person or a situation in an unethical way or for selfish purposes. We've met those kinds of people. We've heard about those kinds of shrewd people, and some of them might even be leaders though that's not a really good leader or a healthy leader. Now, it would be very strange to have this quality lifted up by Jesus, but he does so, but not the secondary definition, only the first one, which is to be keen-witted, clever, or sharp in practical manners. Jesus means the former, and he calls you and me to be that keen-witted, clever, and sharp person in ethical ways in loving ways and for God's purposes and community with the same intensity as other people are shrewd in unethical and selfish ways. So let's take a closer look at some of the lessons of this surprising parable and that it is really talking about how to use our lives to cheat death by making the right moves while we still can. So the first lesson that I pick up on from our passage is that God will not put up with injustice as a pattern of life without disruption. That is, God doesn't put up 
with injustice without disrupting that at some point. The manager has one of those huge disrupting events in his life. And it takes place because he's been acting with extortion in his mind. The manager is casting a poor light on his master's reputation and the master has concluded that he will relieve the manager of his position and power to represent him in public. Jesus is making a statement by analogy about how God views and punishes the problem of unjust activity. There will be an imminent crisis that falls around the life of a person committed to taking advantage of others. So let's talk about that a little more. The manager in Jesus' story is a shrewd person in the worst sense of the word, unethical and cunning despite living in an honor culture. He misuses his master's resources for his own selfish purposes and advantages and he's been found out and told he's going to be dismissed, placed in charge of his master's wealth and operations to manage it for him and make a profit. He's been skimming off the top and taking advantage and taking more for himself and cheating his master. And when he is caught, he doesn't say, oh, sorry, or I didn't know, or I've made some mistakes, nor does he admit his sinfulness and repent in hopes of forgiveness and a new lease on life. Calling in those same business people who are in debt to his master, he proposes to them to charge their, change their bills so that they owed his master less and owe him for allegiance and goodwill as a result, as a soft kind of extortion. You see, he's saying, look, if I reduce your bill, you're gonna owe me personally to take good care of me because we live in an honor culture where the worst thing in the world would be for you to receive a gift and not make good on that gift. In this way, the manager hopes to make friends with these people by using his influence while he still has a small window of time. He's very shrewd to do this before he's dismissed. And the people who are in debt to the manager's master are also shrewd in the cunning sense. They saw a way to relieve some of their debts and increase their potential profits and not one of them hesitated to take advantage of the situation, much less refuse. So Jesus didn't seem to need to explain this story. His listeners would have been no more surprised that someone was embezzling from the master or a company or a community than we are when we hear those kinds of stories in the news today. And it's not surprising that this story represents a reversal of fortune for the worldly shrewd because God has set it up that if you're involved in injustice and corruption and extortion, etc., there's going to be a time of reckoning. It comes. Now that brings us to our second lesson from the parable. We can't predict our earthly futures, but we can prepare for our eternal future. What do I mean by that? Well, let me ask you a very interesting question. What is a black swan? Have you ever heard the term black swan? A black swan is an extremely rare event with severe consequences. It cannot be predicted beforehand, though many claim it should be predictable after the fact. Black swan events can cause catastrophic damage to the economy. And because they cannot be predicted, they can only be prepared for by building robust systems and institutions. Reliance on Standard forecasting tools can both fail to predict and potentially increase vulnerability to black swans by propagating risk and offering false security. The term was popular, popularized by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, a finance professor, writer, and former Wall Street trader. Taleb wrote about the idea of a black swan event in a 2007 book, prior to the events of 
the 2008 financial crisis. Can you believe that? He writes a book about this, and one year later, we all experienced the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Taleb argued that because black swan events are impossible to predict due to the extreme rarity, and yet they have catastrophic consequences, it's important for people to always assume a black swan event is possible, when, whatever it may be, and to plan accordingly. He later used the 2008 financial crisis and the idea of a black swan event to argue that if a broken system is allowed to fail, it actually strengthens against the catastrophe of future black swan events. I say this with pain and truth. The world is experiencing a black swan event. We knew there were pandemics that were possible, but I dare say we didn't plan for them. We didn't plan to have our lives changed like they've changed. And it's painful and it can be a real surprise. Now the real surprise in the parable is the response of the rich owner who commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Sure, he'd been taken advantage of, but he understood the boldness it took to embark on a new course of direction during that brief moment of time that he had still some power. And here's where Jesus makes his first point about shrewd Christians. It's a shame, he remarks. I can't believe he says this. It's a shame that those who are dishonest are more shrewd than those who are honest. If there were more shrewd Christians who were just as sharp-witted and clever, then more people would be coming to a knowledge of the love of God and joining in the mission and ministry of God's community. You see, God created us with minds so that we can think, think, think things out and plan and reason. And we are called to use those God-given powers for good and the best ways possible, and especially for God's purposes in our lives and in the life of the world. Jesus is saying, look, these guys are shrewd for temporary things that don't really matter. Why can't Christians, why can't followers of Jesus Christ be shrewd about the things of eternal life? Be shrewd about the things that have to do with their own soul. Be shrewd about making their preparation for living eternally. And that brings us to our third lesson from this morning. God gives a small opportunity, a small window of opportunity for people to get their acts together and reposition themselves in preparation for eternal life. It seems very strategic that Jesus is telling this parable in light of his journey to the cross. Jesus is not supporting the goal of life to be a successful woman or man, but rather to be a godly person of faith, regardless of social or material circumstances, and to grow social capital for the purpose of bringing as many people into relationship with God as possible. God has given people the power of rapidly making new choices in order to set up new consequences that are a blessing not only for themselves, but also for those who they may have taken advantage of or who just need help. Now there's some ways in which people have looked at this parable and come up with their own ideas about what it's saying. One thought from history is that seeing that men often purchase friendship for themselves at the expense of others, we are to be truly ashamed if we do not procure the goodwill of our neighbors with the goods which the Lord has bestowed on us freely and liberally, making sure that by this means riches, which are often occasions of sin, are used for another end and purpose. Essentially, whatever we have, the property of it is God's, and we have only to use it according to the direction of our great Lord and for his honor. So that, that thought that's been going around for a thousand or more years is that God owns everything and we're supposed to use it and not just hoard 
but to use it to make friends for Jesus, to make friends in the kingdom of God. There's also a strong cultural taboo regarding talking about money with others. And yet most people I know, including myself and my wife, struggle at times with questions about money. How much is enough? How much should we give away to the church? How much should we give to a person who's hurting in front of us? How can we raise children who are both wise and generous? And so on. While I'm not sure this parable gives us clear guidance to any or all of those questions, it does present characters who also struggle with money and with resources. Characters with mixed motives and yet who change over time in their relationship to their circumstances. We need to adapt with God and to discuss the matter of, of money and of legacy and of estate planning with trusted friends in order to survive and thrive. Right now is a great time to be sitting down with someone and saying, what is the purpose of my life and how are my finances and the resources that God has given me how is that going to reflect my spiritual health and the state of my soul and my anticipation to be living in heaven? It's a powerful question. And it's time, it's time for people to ask what they should be doing. Now that brings us to a fourth lesson. God wants Christians to not embarrass themselves or him with their lack of shrewdness. This is probably the hardest lesson of all. I mean, Jesus is looking down at us and saying, you're just not shrewd. You just don't see what's really about to happen. And that applies to eternal, king, the, um, to eternal of kingdom of God projects that really matter compared to how practically adaptable and creative people can be when they focus on finances in view of an imminent crisis. It really shouldn't be a stretch for the Christian community and individual Christians to welcome good thinking. And this good kind of shrewdness, the, the, the practical application of God's wisdom has led historically to Christians building up thousands of colleges and universities and, and building hospitals and doing all manner of good works around the world and keeping learning alive during the Middle Ages and building organizations to effectively care for the least among us. Now, I don't hear a whole lot of talk these days about Christians on the front lines of the coronavirus, but historically, Christians have been at the front line of every disaster, making an impact for God. What about us? What about us? Often, Christians can be sloppy or short-sighted or believe incorrectly that our personal even worldly wisdom doesn't apply. But it does. God has given every one of us brains and talent and gifts and experiences that may not quite fit the Christian traits of joyfulness and committed and loving, but they are so important for the mission and ministry of the church. Another point that Jesus goes on to make from this parable is that as shrewd Christians, we have a particular and special calling and purpose for using our cleverness. It's not for the sake of money or mammon, it's for the sake of God that we're supposed to live. It can, our lives can only be based on serving God and not on other things. We are call called to plant ourselves on the bedrock of God and God's kingdom, rather than the shifting sands of wealth of any kind be it money, power, prestige, popularity, or anything or anyone else, we can't serve two masters, not fully at the same time. As shrewd Christians, we're called to make God our primary focus, to make justice and peace and love and the compassion of God our core values. Now what that means in my mind is that the profit we make from the resources we have is profit for the Lord, for the Lord's purposes. You know, yesterday, I had a really strange experience with my wife. We rescued a baby great horned owl from near where we live. And there was no money in it, but there was a neighbor 
who was asking for help. And the, I watched this and the other neighbor said, I, I don't have anything I can do to help you. And then my wife and I came and we, we brought a box and we said, we'll take it to the Lindsay Wildlife Museum. And, and we carefully scooped up this owl, this baby owl that was bleeding from the tip of its horn beak. It was bleeding, drip, 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 little blood. And it was, it was hyperventilating. <laughs> it was just in need of rescue. And so with a little cloth blanket I put over it, I put my hands on it and I covered it and I put it up into the, a box. And then we took the blanket off of it and closed the box. And we put it in our car where there was air conditioning and we took the, took the great horn owl baby to the Lindsay Wildlife Museum and we dropped it off. And I thought, what's the value of this, of our time and, and, and all of this? And I realized my wife, was so excited but that, that we had done this. And then I found out that when my, I sent pictures to my daughter, my daughter said, you're heroes, you're heroes for, for saving this little baby owl. Oh, I wished I could have been there. I wished I could have made a difference to help save that owl. And I thought, my gosh, what little thing it took to get my daughter to say, you're a hero, Dad. You're a hero, Mom. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I'll tell you this. I couldn't spend enough money in the world necessarily to get my daughter to say what a hero I am for helping that little owl. But I'd do it again a thousand times now that I know the key to her heart is rescuing little baby animals. And I guess what I'm saying is that you never know what your wealth will do to open up someone's heart towards you and towards the values of the kingdom of God. As I close, let me invite you to prayerfully consider a final thought. What if this was not a parable about us and our lack of shrewdness as much as about Jesus and his shrewdness? Jesus made a risky investment of his life on our behalf so that we would live eternally. Jesus had that investment start to pay off. And he opens up the possibility for us to be smart about life, about handling money, about reaching out to strangers, about finding new ways to share the good news of God. Learn from Jesus how to assess the human heart. Learn from Jesus how to assess motivations and outcomes of a life built on wisdom and direction of life under God. And use this global virus as an opportunity to recognize that surprises will come and they will challenge everything in our lives. But God is still with us. We wanna invite God to join with us in finding the greatest wisdom for whether we should buy or sell our home, whether we should spend money or keep money, or whether we should give some of it away, or whatever we should do with it. Ask God, ask God to help you know how to spend your time, your talent, and your treasure. And God will give you answers so that you can turn your worldly treasure into treasure in heaven. And you will be happier for it and people around you will be happier for it. And people around you will see and admire God's quality of shrewdness and love working together in your midst. Let's pray. Lord God, we wanna ask for you to work in our hearts and in our lives. This word shrewdness is not a comfortable word. Many times we think that it's just about somebody taking advantage of us. And we don't always have all the wisdom to know how to deal with big change. Lord, I ask that you would come into our lives in a fresh new way to help us seek your wisdom for how we should practically use and live out our lives the length of time that we have. Lord God, help us to be thankful. Help us to be wise, help us to be clever, help us to use all that you've given us 
And Lord, if we don't have it, then help us to find somebody who can help us. Not somebody who takes advantage of us, but somebody who helps us move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to join with me in singing a final song. And we're going to do that with Charlotte. So let's go walk that way. There you are, sweetheart. Hi. Ready to sing? All right. Hey, the, the Zoom meeting, just for you, if you're going to be on that in about 40 minutes, the link is 996-1663-3095. That's 996-1663-3095. And uh, that's today. April 22nd, oh no, is it not the 22nd? No. Nope. It's the 26th. It was on your email on the oh, okay, 22nd. Do okay. they need the URL? No, no, no. They okay. just need to go to zoom.com. Zoom.com and then 996-1663-3095. Man, this is funny stuff, this technology. But you're shrewd to put that there so that I can share it with people. And thanks, Greg. All right, so with that said, we're going to sing a song called Thank You, Lord, and we're going, to, we're going to sing three verses together. Thank you, Lord, you've been so good to me, and you feed us with your love. Let's do that as an offering unto the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. want to say we love you we want to say hello to all our Sonoma Valley Community Church friends and family we want to let you know we're praying for you we want to invite you to email us uh, at info at we love sonoma.com we want to invite you to give and to share and to build a testimony that God is proud of and that you're proud of and that we can celebrate thank you for coming Let's praise the Lord this week. We'll see you next week. God bless. Amen.